Positioning and premium pricing are very unsexy. I think they're really exciting because there's so much you can do and there's, there's a lot of fun you can have. Because part of the positioning that I do is just more personality. And you think, I get paid quite a bit of money just to kind of stand in front of people and swear. You know, only people like Mike Reed and, um, what's his name? The fat bloke is dead. Oh, oh Bernard Manning. Bernard Manning can, uh, can get away with that kind of thing. Not being dead, obviously, because <laughs> we all get away with being dead in the end. Um, so that's why, why I've done this, because it is the most important thing. You, all the rest of it, and people don't seem to understand that once you get your positioning and everything else right, everything else falls into place, and, and the pricing right, everything falls into place. But if you don't have them right, there's no point in doing lead generation. But it's dead anyway, but there's no point in doing lead generation, because... Uh, you, you don't know who you're selling to, you don't know what you're selling, and you're not selling in the right way. So we're going to start with, what I've done, I've kind of taken a, a leaf out of Dan's book, if you like, and I've distilled these down into some 19 principles. So the first one, we could talk about fundamentals. The first is, is your ignorance is deadly. People say ignorance is bliss, well it ain't, because it then creeps up and kills you. Um, and what, what we need to be thinking of is what, what fundamentals can we focus on that make businesses successful? before we even get into positioning and pricing. And the first one is thinking about what makes businesses unsuccessful. And the first is, is numbers. Um, there was a lady who joined the Inner Circle some years ago. And <laughs> she was a bookkeeper. And she had this really good idea. She, she was going to take money, she would take fees from people to teach them, people who've got no money because they're in financial problems, having financial problems. She was going to take money from them to coach them on how to spend their money more wisely. And I said to her, but you haven't got any money. They haven't got any money to spend on coaching you. And she said, oh, yeah. Didn't think of that. It's like people who want to sell to students. There's no point. The students haven't got any money. and They're all price buyers. There's no point. Um, and then she says, well, I'll, I'll rent up my bookkeeping services then. Now, I don't know much about bookkeeping. Um, but I'm guessing it's a fairly skilled profession, isn't it? And she was going to charge £15 an hour. Well, you probably get that work in a pub these days. The point being... Her business was not economically viable. The numbers didn't add up. Um, and there's a lot of businesses out there that, that are like that. And no amount of marketing and, and clever stuff will let you market your way out of an economically unviable business, which is why people need to put their prices up. You know, there are businesses out there that are doing deals and selling stuff at a loss and don't even realise it. And Vicky's, one of the biggest things that Vicky said to me is you need to focus on your numbers, which is true. But look, I mean, luckily, I'm, my numbers, are, the disparity between my, my costs and my revenues are so big, it doesn't matter that I've not focused too much on it. But some businesses are operating on very thin margins indeed, and they, they're not making any money at all. But they, they think that with all this, this net floating around, all this turnover, there must be some profit in there, and there isn't. This is why a lot of um, big firms go bust. It's why Woolies went bust. Because you think about Woolworths, they had a massive staff bill. So to them, cash flow was absolutely vital. And there's actually no low-cost provider out there that I can think of that has done it sustainably for many years. They all go under in the end. Um, one exception I can think of is Ryanair. But the thing is with Ryanair, they are so tight on their margins and, and their costs, and they've got loads of ancillary things as well that they sell. Otherwise, they couldn't sustain it. I love, um, what's his name, O'Leary. He's a bit of an asshole, but he's a, I love him, he's great. The way he's made money from that business. Um, so that's the first thing. You, you can't market your way out of an, an uh, economically unviable business. The second thing is doing what you love and hoping the money comes is doomed to failure. And I see this all the times with, with, <laughs> with people. <laughs> Book reviews and things like that um, that no one's ever going to want to buy. You, know, you might enjoy doing it, but no one's going to enjoy buying those things or want to. Um, People have this idea that if they, if they do what they love, the money will come in. It just doesn't work like that. It's not that kind of party. I think you should love what you do. If you don't, it's pretty sad because you could end up being miserable. So by all means, do something that you do love. But you know, to, to have a, a hobby and a, and a passion and say, well, I'm going to make money at that is, with a rare exception, it doesn't work out that way. So these are all things that make businesses unsuccessful. Copying your competitors like, is like blind leading the blind as well. Um, one of the, again, another problem I see with businesses is they, they get their marketing education and their operations and stuff by
by looking at other businesses in the same niche, because that's the way it's done. Um, and I made that mistake myself when I first became a copywriter. I, I, I actually <laughs> remember with some shame saying to Sarah um, about this graphic designer, well, he's been in business for 10 years, he must know something about it. Well, of course he didn't, really, not about business. He knew about graphic design, but he wasn't a businessman, really. So he went to BNI, so I went to BNI. <laughs> and I think we'll leave that one there, shall we? <laughs> Didn't go, didn't stay, stay, stay there for long. It was appalling, I tell you. It was appalling. Because the, most people are stupid anyway, but the kind of people who were going to bed and I were really fucking stupid. And you think, how do they get out of bed in the morning and not trip over their own feet? <laughs> um, the thing is with copying, it's normal. But normal is also, because everybody does it, but normal is 80% um, of businesses going out of business in the first five years. And it all comes down to marketing. I mean, no, I know I said a few minutes ago, if you've got an uneconomically, in, uh, a economically unviable business, you can't market your way out of it. That's true. But if it is economically viable, marketing will fix it. And marketing, good marketing, rests very firmly on the foundations of what we can talk about now, and also premium pricing and premium positioning. I hope my flies are done up. <laughs> yes. Um, so what makes businesses successful? When you can't expect different results by repeating past behaviour. If your business is doing okay now, you keep doing what you're doing, you keep getting what you're getting, all of the things being equal. Um, yeah, you can win the lottery, you can have your, your father die unexpectedly and leave you a wedge of cash, which happened to me. Um, but for the most part, you just keep repeating the same behaviour, you get the same thing. It, it, does, it does amaze me. The number of people who say join the inner circle um, and in the past have joined Elite and they learn all this stuff and they get all this motivation and, and arse kicking in the hot seats but they don't actually do anything different. I mean classic examples of where that doesn't happen is like Drew. Drew and Terry get on the phone with me, they ask me a question, what should we do, I tell them and then they go and do it. Yeah, And it's worked for what, three, four years? Michelle it used to be the same but now she questions it all. <laughs> Now she's a lady what lunches, she does nothing. Dom's the same, Dom's the same. Dom, <laughs> he, he's a lady what lunches, yeah. <laughs> but he what, no, they, uh, what do they call it in Sunderland? Grub or something? Grub. Grub. Like grub. <laughs> yeah. he, he's, a, he's a lady what grubs. <laughs> but Dom's the same, he, he basically, when I tell him to do something, he will do it. Zip. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it'll really improve your business, mate, I'm telling you. Um, and it's funny because I've been reading Dom's emails recently and they are the echoes of EB Genius in there. I'm sure you copy some of mine. <laughs> it's fine because um, I know someone else who does that, shamelessly, Cat, Cat, <laughs> Andrew. <laughs> I actually had someone uh, probably a year or two ago now email me and say, look at this page, do you realise this bastard's ripping you off word for word? It was his website. <laughs> and I says, well, yeah, he's in Elite, he's, he's allowed to. Pretty much, <laughs> come on, pretty much. <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> well, it was quite funny. I says, yes, he's allowed to. So yes, pe people who, who just do things differently, um, when they're told to, like the people I just mentioned, um, they tend to make more money. Now, that's not to say that everything, you, you should do everything differently from everyone else, because that's just stupid. Think about it first. Um, you can't expect to get different results from everyone else. Well, I've kind of just said about that. If other people are doing things and you copy them, you'll get pretty much the same results that they do. That's just why businesses all look the same. This is why people end up competing on price, because there's no other way to compete, because they're all doing the same thing. And we had a guy in the inner circle probably about three years ago now. I can't remember his name, John something or other. And he, he actually got a phone call from someone in the same industry. I think he did a magazine or something. And this woman phoned him, was yelling down the phone and said, we don't do business like that in this, this town. Because he was doing something better than she was, better marketing, and she just didn't like it. She wanted them to be all the same. When I started uh, copywriting, and I, I came back from my first Dan Kennedy thing, I put my prices up. And I had a phone call from uh, some bloke who fancied himself as being the, the senior copywriter in Suffolk. And he was saying, you can't charge that much, that's more than I charge. So what? Who the fuck are you anyway? Stupid cunt. 
<laughs> but yeah, he, was, he, he went out of his way to phone me to complain because I was charging more than well, I've been doing this for 20 years. You're new on the scene. Yeah, and? Look, here's a dick. Suck it. <laughs> Fucking hell. But that's what people are like. People will get like that. Um, that's what happened. Dan Kennedy calls it marketing incest, by the way. And everyone gets dumber and stupider as they and all look the same. Like, like in real incest. I remember when Holly was born, my oldest, um, although this was in Suffolk, not Norfolk, which is even worse. I swear this is true. <laughs> the mid we took her to the, the GP and the, the, the midwife there, or the resident midwife, kind of counted her fingers and toes and you know, pulled around and just made sure she was all there. And I swear this is true, and she says, it's nice to have a normal one for a change. <laughs> I thought, what must they be having these fucking troglodytes, you know? <laughs> <laughs> special kids with one eye in the middle of the forehead. That was Suffolk for you. Um, I used to work the doors in Felixstowe. And Felix, because Felixstowe is like not really anywhere. It's, you, you don't go to Felixstowe. You either go through it or you just ignore it. So everyone's in bread there as well. And I used to work as a doorman at this nightclub. And the fucking people walking through, they went, mm. it was terrible. You know, who's got the chromosome this week? <laughs> terrible. So anyway, if you, you can't expect extraordinary results from ordinary behaviour. Oh, I haven't said that yet. Yeah, if you want to do something different with your businesses and, and be wildly successful, um, charge the high prices. Um, you're dribbling again, Michelle. Uh, charge the high prices and, and, and stand out, if you like. Really stand out, like, say, I do, or Dan Kennedy does. You've got to do things very differently. Because extraordinary businesses don't come from ordinary behaviour. I mean, that's, that follows. Look at, look at Dom, the, Dom the, the waves he's making in his industry. No one else in your industry is doing what you're doing. And I know you get hate mail, which you love, because you send it to me. You go, look at this. <laughs> um, how did it feel the first time you got it? Um, but, uh, well, it's been happening for a while. I'm used to it, I've been used to it for quite a while now. You prepped me and said it, that, that it would happen. But I think it happened last year when, when I did my book and I had the swear words in and people didn't like it. And I think that was when I, you said, well, what do they know about marketing? You know what I mean? They don't mm. know anything about it. Um, I was tempted to be pulled to be normal, you know, uh, to do what everybody else was doing, but uh, you shot snapping out of that. Yeah, that, that's a, did you hear what he just said? He was tempted to be pulled back into being normal. Well, then you'd just be the same as every other dog walker out yeah. there. Yeah. So you've got to be, you've got to be very different. Um, and I mean really different, not like these graphic designers, so we're doing ads that's different, we'll put penguins on it instead of anchovies or something. <laughs> it's really different. And we'll come on to how you do that tomorrow. Uh, and if your business is viable, there are very few things you can't fix with basically raising your prices. Um, there's a butcher in my local town, and I was probably 10 years ago now, I did a bit of work with him. And all I told him to do was increase his prices. And he wouldn't do it at first, and I, he did in the end. Because his margins were so razor thin an increase of 10%, you know, he increased his profits by a massive amount, about 90% or something. And he increased his prices, I said, well, take your top 20% of, of selling stuff that you sell the most of, and increase the prices by 10% on that and see what happens. He had one query. Bloke came in and says, I'm not going to try and do the accent. Ed could probably do it. Um, he says, as, as the price, of, he's, this guy used to come in once a week to get a single pork chop. He lived on his own. And he says, has the price of pork gone up? And the bloke says, no. Oh, all right. Bought his pork chop and that was it. So he was leaving all that money behind. It's quite sad, really. So the secret to success is doing what others won't, not can't, but won't do. Because we can do all this stuff. Yeah, I mean, you might get the phone calls and the hate mail. Um, and people saying, we don't do business like that around here. That's not how it's done. But that's just words. That's just their opinion. I don't know of any industries in this country or in the UK where you are constrained by law or regulation to what you can charge. I'm not aware, I'm just not saying there aren't any, but I'm not aware of any. I guess maybe somewhere in the, the health care there might be, I don't know. And I know in California, I believe you're only allowed to charge a certain amount for a haircut. In which case, who'd be a fucking hairdresser in California? But for the most part, you can charge whatever you like. This is why you, I mean, there are some examples of premium pricing in this manual, but this is why you can, you get stereo leads for 25 grand, you know. And it, no one in their right mind would pay 25 grand for stereo leads, but you can buy them if you want them, and some people do. So, 
And what was I just said? Yeah, doing the things that others won't do, not can't, but won't. And we'll come across a lot of this stuff in the next couple of days. And some of it's quite scary. I mean, everyone in this room is probably familiar with it all. Um, but there'll probably be some stuff here that will make you go, mm, can't do that. And certainly at home, you listeners at home, I guarantee you'll, you'll come up with ideas and re or rather reasons and excuses why this stuff won't work for you, why you shouldn't be doing it, why you can't do it. Um, and it's all bullshit. That's what they are excuses. You'll convince yourself that you've got a real legitimate reason not to do any of this stuff. And they're all bullshit. Right, only three ways to grow your business. Sell to more people, or get more customers, basically. Sell more stuff to the customers you've already got and new customers, or sell at higher prices. Now, the interesting thing is, uh, selling to more people is obvious. That's what everybody does. That's why everyone is advertising looking for new customers. But what people make the mistake of doing is, is they say we want more business, and they think that as being synonymous with we need more customers. They do need more business, but the easiest business you'll ever get is the business that you've already got, as in selling to the people that are already there. But getting new customers is obvious. That's why people are advertising on Facebook instead of following it with their lists. Um, the number of people, who was it? Phil. Like, it took me a while to batter it into him because he was obsessed with Facebook advertising. So was Ben, the web guy. And I had to, you know, it was really hard work getting these people to realise that the customers they've already got are sources of referrals, sources of, of more sales they can make, etc., etc. Um, so it's obvious, and it's the, it's the first and only thing most people try to do. You know, business exists, uh, it, it's amazing, they exist on a, a, a flow of leads coming in, sell once, let these people disappear into the, the sunset. Not realising that if you look upon lead generation, which is dead, if you look upon it as being, um, some people call it buying customers. I prefer to call it investing in relationships with customers, which is a more accurate way of doing it. Um, but they don't do that at all. They just sell off the page, one sale, let people go. Um, it's simple, but not easy because anyone can go onto Google, set up an account, start advertising. Anyone can go to Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Periscope. Is that still around, Periscope? Or has it died a death? But anyone, anyone can go into it, and it doesn't cost you a single penny until someone clicks. So, you know, th that's, that's the attraction of it. That's the, it's, it's so simple. It's not easy, of course, because once you've got the click, then you've got to convert them to a lead and then a sale, which isn't easy. Um, and often to the point where you are sinking quite a lot of money into getting these leads and then trying to sell to them. Um, without mentioning names, one of my colleagues costs him 300 pounds to get a new customer. It costs me about 90. But he gets more than I do, so he makes more money. But um, I can get my book in front of in someone's hands for about 15 quid, including advertising which is pretty good actually. But most people don't, it, because they don't take a long-term view of things, you know, there is one ex-member of Elite, whom I won't name, whose business went tits up because he lost sight of this. He was spending seven grand a month on Google AdWords and not making any return. It was, I think it was a case of there's so much net coming in, there must be some profit in it. Or some, there's so much gross, there must be some net there. I'm fascinated by what Michelle is doing. You're like a little girl, aren't you? Yeah, don't use all my ink up, will you? I will. <laughs> don't use all my ink up. Um, so it's, it's, it's simple but not easy. And I think we've all found this. You know, it's, it's, we've all probably tried advertising and stuff, and then we probably get lazy as well, and we don't, um, don't actually follow through with the numbers. I was talking to Kev, um, Sasquatch's other half, about some software and numbers and stuff, and it's really quite important. I think you'd do well to talk to Kev as well. Yeah. I'm also going to get Chris <coughs> Cardell to talk to him, because I think that would be good for Chris as well. Um, so it's, it's simple and easy. It's easily available. I say anyone can go and set up an account on AdWords, Google AdWords, uh, double click, Bing, Facebook, LinkedIn. Well, I say anyone can. I mean, I know one person who went into a Google AdWords account and made such a hash of it, they gave her money back. <laughs> that was your mother. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the same woman, when Ash is changing a tyre, nearly ran him over. 
She's sitting in the car and just decides to take the handbrake off. I mean, what, what is she on, man? I wish she was here. Because when you, when you remind her of that, she goes bright red. It's really funny. I mean, she's a really smart lady, your mother. And then she does stupid, fucked up things like that. What, what is wrong with her? Mind you, I'm one to talk. I crashed my wife's car. And the amusing thing is, that because I take testosterone jabs, um, and I was driving along with my daughter coming back from the psychotherapist, and she was having a special and unspecialed. And uh, I was musing to myself about how the testosterone, don't get roid rage or anything, don't get angry, but I've noticed I'm less risk averse. Five minutes later, I crashed the car. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, how fucking ironic was that? It was really quite funny because the, the, the bend, if you imagine the road goes like that, it's a really tight bend and there's a road off here. And I was going this way. So if I'd have just gone straight onto the side road, I could have stopped to reverse, turn around, and I'd have been fine. But I had this matter, I can get around this, I can do it, I can do it. Oh shit, I can't do it. Anyway, so we wrote the car off. I wrote her car off. Because it was a fairly old car and it fucked the, fuck the radiator and it wasn't worth fixing. So we've got a Land Rover now. I've crashed that the other day as well. <laughs> I hit the curb and tore the tyre in off. I had to get a new tyre. Luckily, I was just around the corner from the uh, place. My language was appalling, as you can imagine. It's not good at the best of times. And I was in the car with Rosie again. She says, you all right, Dad? I says, yeah, I'm just angry. She says, why? I says, because I'm so stupid. It's frustrating. I think it's the meds. I don't like driving now. Um, say again? <laughs> They're driving over here. Shocking, isn't it, Ed? It is shocking. I've, I've been here for 10 years now, and I, I've had more near-death experiences over here than I had in... 25, 30 years before. It's shocking. You wouldn't believe how bad it is. I've seen people on the way to Shannon, there's, a, there's a, an area, there's a, there's a stretch of road which is really wide. And we saw this car in front overtake another car and another car overtaking that one. <laughs> so there, it was like double overtake. I couldn't believe it. Amazing. The, the death toll is, eh? No, and the, the, the death toll on these roads is huge, isn't it, in Ireland? I think it's the drink as well. Because you have all these parish priests, right? They, they go around with the little churches and they're in mass and they're knocking back the holy wine. And uh, they're getting pissed. And a few years ago, this priest actually said, uh, this, is, this is the extent to which religious people can, uh, can convince themselves that it's all real and happening. And, and it's, what's the word I'm looking for? I can't think of the word. But anyway, he basically, it's in the newspaper, he says, uh, because they, what they did, they changed, they lowered the limit of allowed that you have to, alcohol that you're allowed to have in your blood. And this priest is complaining, saying, look, this isn't fair because we have the communion wine. And I know it looks like alcohol in our blood, but it's not. It's holy alcohol kind of thing. <laughs> and it was. It was um, justification. It's, it's nonsense. You're fucking pissed, mate. Admit it. But he was saying it's, it looks just like alcohol, but it's not. <laughs> Fuck. Let's go and abuse a few kids, will you? Yeah, it's true. How's your baby, anyway, Drew? How's the baby? Yeah. Oh, oh by the way, I'm a granddad. I'm grandpa. Grumps. So anyway, it's relatively risky, for reasons I've just, uh, uh, just given, that you can spend a lot of money on generating leads that are dead, um, and then you've got, to, you've, got to, you've got to sell to them. And I always say to people, when they start a new advertising campaign, no matter what they're doing, be prepared to lose money in the beginning, because it very rarely works first time. And there's a guy called Jim Yagi who did some Google, advertise, Google AdWords for me a couple of years ago. And to be fair, the guy says, no, be prepared to lose. Some. How much can you, he basically said, how much are you prepared to lose? And I says, well, I'll give it 20 grand. And he says, that's good, good some money. We'll know if it's going to work or not. And it didn't. That's fine. But you don't know these things until you try it. Now, for a lot of people, 20 grand would put them out of business. Um, so what they do is they, they skim, they, they, not only do they not do it properly, but they scrimp and save and try and do it cheaply. And as Dan Kennedy said many times, again, very contrary to what other businesses do, you, you, know, you should be looking to spend as much as you possibly can to get a new customer. Not as little as you possibly can. But of course, you can't do that without cash flow. And this is why we have high prices and things. Or well, we should have high prices. It's speculative, because selling can be hard, and you don't know how traffic's going to convert, so you paid for it. Um, dealing with the unknown, for the same reasons. Okay, you don't know how these things are going to pan out until you've done them, and then you've spent the money. Okay? It's a bit of a... It is true that you don't spend money on pay-per-click until someone clicks. So it's free to get started. I think that's a bit disingenuous because it isn't really free to get started at all. It's, it's free to get, 
It's free until somebody clicks. Well, that's when your job starts, really, isn't it? Um, that, that's when you start having to make the money. And I remember once we went to Dublin and I had a, an email come through saying my card had been declined for Google. And I, shit, a bit of a panic, ch check, I logged into my account. In the train journey, in the time it would take me to, from getting home to, from home on the train up to Dublin, I spent 800 quid on pay per click. <laughs> Didn't even know I was doing it. And my card had hit the limit. So that made for a great holiday, as you can imagine. <laughs> And you're at the mercy of unscrupulous bastards. Um, the whole industry of them, from advertising reps to people like me, who's selling you the, the latest, you know, fandangly thing. Um, it's all guaranteed to work, and um, they reel you in, and with all the inflated promises and stuff. And I'm probably Dan Kennedy's honest too, but I'm one of the very few people who tell it like it really is. I, I've, I do have things to sell, but I don't sell shit, and I don't. I don't gloss over things. I, I mean, I know why people do it, and I don't think they're necessarily dishonest. They actually believe it, I think, sometimes. But what they don't understand is things like statistical significance. Um, and they are very much, they're very much bought into their own mindset of, um, I can't remember the bloody word I'm looking for. Confirmation bias, that's what it is. Confirmation bias. They're seeking confirmation. They already believe something, so they're trying to fit everything into that worldview. Bill Glazer did this. Bill Glazer did this, and it, I was, it was a bit of an eye-opener for me. I like Bill, nice guy. I don't think he's dishonest either. But he did something, and this is so easy to do, because it seems logical. I remember him saying that he had two, two clients, virtually identical businesses, virtually identical um, different towns with virtually identical demographics and things, and doing the same things, and one business was working and one business wasn't. And because he's big, big into the mindset, so the, it must have been the mindset, something wooey going on. It's bullshit. But his confirmation bias is such that my system works, it works every time. If it don't, doesn't work, then you're doing it wrong. Um, that sounds like quite a logical thing to say, but it's actually a logical fallacy. It's untestable, so it's got no value whatsoever. But he was convinced that his system works. And it, the thing is, what works for me might not work for you, even though you're doing exactly the same thing. This is why I'm not bothered about people copying me. I see people on Facebook all the time. Do you know Dan Meredith? He's great at what he does. He's an arsehole because I told him to be an arsehole. Same with Paul Moore, and they were both, I mean, I'm not taking credit for their success, but they would both say that I, wrongly they would say I gave them permission to be themselves. I don't give anyone permission to be themselves because they don't need it, but that's how they feel, how they felt. Um, they do what they do very well, and I've seen people try and copy them as well, and they can't do it. People try and copy Ben Settle, people try and copy me, but because they don't understand it properly, it's obviously, a, it's obviously fake, and it, it stands out like a fucking hard-on in a nudist kindergarten that it's fake. But we'll say more about this. Anyway, you're at the mercy of unscrupulous bastards getting more, getting more customers. But that's what people do. We are on page 19. No, 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 19. Sound like my son. <laughs> he came out as being gay the other day, by the way. He sent me a card for Father's Day, and it's like, thanks for being the best dad in the world, love you lots, and his handwritings are worse than mine because he's a spaz. Um, and he says, P.S., I am gay. <laughs> <laughs> so I send him a WhatsApp and says, you're gay, are you, son? He says, yeah. All right, fine, fair enough. How long have you known? A few months. Do you mind? No. Can I watch? <laughs> no. I says, you got a boyfriend? He says, no. And then the other night I was having a conversation with him on WhatsApp. He says, how, how can I find a boyfriend? I says, oh, I don't really know. It's not something I've ever done. I says, you've got, probably got dating sites. We've got gay clubs, I suppose. He says, I asked a boy out at school and he said, no. I says, did you ask him if he was gay first? He said, no. <laughs> <laughs> That might be an idea. Somebody said he was bisexual, but I think he was joking. Oh, fair enough. Um, but I said to him, if you want to go to a gay club, I'll go with you. I'll make sure you're okay. Or my mate Steve will go with you. Chaperone, you know, keep him safe. But my wife, um, my ex-wife, she says, oh, he's, oh, he's just confused. Well, that's ridiculous, because if he said he was straight, he wouldn't be confused, would he? This is what he used to get me at school as well, about God. I said, I don't believe in God. Oh, you're too young to, to make that decision. But if I said I was believing in God, I was not too young to say that decision, am I? Well, that's different. No, it isn't. <laughs> anyway, the second thing is sell more stuff. This is probably the second easiest thing. Um, it's easier than selling to more people, but still vastly underused. I mean, I don't know how often I'll get new, new leads because all my lead generation is broken at the moment. It's dead anyway. Um, but I, I, 
I mean, I, I know, because it's a small, I've got a small business, a small numbers business, I know who my best customers are. I know, I mean, those DVDs are on sale now. And I, I know who's going to be buying them, pretty much. Sometimes people would come along as a bit of a surprise, like Dom was a bit of a surprise joining Elite, although I had my eye on him for a while. And Ed as well joining Elite, and, and Tim. But otherwise, I've got my eye on people. I know who's going to buy what. It's, you know, just, you just learn to know these people. Selling to them is easy. Um, the one time I sold a, a seminar place to a new person to me in my business was a big mistake. He went to Cleveland and he was a right cunt. <laughs> <laughs> I knew he was a cunt because on the very first night at the reception, I was talking to Vicky. I don't know, were you there, Michelle, when I was having this conversation? I was having a conversation with, I know Vicky Fraser was there. It was a little high table like this, and I was sitting around with munchies and stuff. And we start talking about daily emails, and he has no experience in them, but he knew they didn't work. I just looked at him, I looked at Vicky, I just shrugged and says, I'm not going to discuss it with you, there's no point. Because you're wrong, <laughs> simple as that. I thought then he's going to be a cunt. And then uh, on the second morning, I think it was, the tables were in a big, big U, for those who weren't there. And I sat um, right on the far end at the left-hand side of the stage as you look out near Dan. And I was very clearly sitting on my own eating, wasn't I? Very clearly, like, I was, had this aura of fuck <laughs> off. <laughs> with my hood up, <laughs> I very had this, clearly had this fuck off aura about me. And he came over and he says, do you mind if I sit down? I said, well, I'm not in the mood for talking. It was free country, you know? So he sat down and started talking to me. And I'm thinking, what the fuck? What part of my body language is telling you, this is okay, sit here? And he just tried to get free consulting out of me. Just, and I just was very... Mm. Mm. Yeah, they were, they were <laughs> laughing at me, bastards. <laughs> I was very close to just swearing at him. I thought, no, he's paid me his money to be it. Yeah. Like, I refunded him in the end. It was either that or spend an hour on Skype with him, which I would have rather severed my own dick, to be honest. Um, anyway, easier than selling to more people, but vastly underused. Because people don't follow up, they don't make offers. Um, Someone had a business a few years ago, um, which is now closed, and her problem was she could only service nine people at one time, residentially. And I says, well, you can't have more people, you can't have more throughput because they're there for a week, so what you're going to have to do is sell more stuff to them when they're there, rather than not being sold to. And I said, well, you know, you know this is it. This, this is what your business is going to be. It can't grow anymore. A bit like you, you can't have any more dogs. You know? This is it. You're going to have to do something else. Well, she didn't, and now she's not doing it anymore. Um, but people, I mean, I'm presuming everybody here follows up and tries to sell more and more and more. <laughs> yeah, I wish you all should, I should. I've got dozens of products, potentially, and I've got, probably got about half a dozen good ones, big ones, and probably another half a dozen um, that I could put together quickly. And I don't sell those either. I know, I, I'm stupid. It's your fault. You're not, co you're not coaching me properly. Do you want to beat it out? Mm. I like the sound of that. Someone has to pay. Oh, I have paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I know I take the piss out of life coaches, but Vicky's pretty damn good. I'm going to give her a, an interview for the Inner Circle, and um, I shall give her a glowing testimonial if it all works. But the, my problem with most life coaches is they're about 25 years old and they have no life experience or brains. What they've done is they've been attracted to the idea of, of being a life coach because they get all this wooey mindset stuff, and they, they don't have to implement it themselves. Um, I saw a meme on Facebook the other day, it's uh, people who see some motivational thing and say, yes, this, and then make no changes in their lives. You know? <laughs> I remember when Rosie was first taken ill, she was um, on suicide watching the, on the secure unit, and I won't name this girl, but she, she's 24, she was a life coach, then she was trying to be a business coach for female entrepreneurs. Um, you know, bearing in mind that this woman is sitting there trying to talk to Michelle and Kat and, you know, Yinka, big scary Yinka, and Yinka, and say, I'd like to coach you so you get more out of life. And they're looking, go away, little girl. <laughs> and she emailed me and she says, um, oh, if, you, if you'd like, like me to speak to your daughter and kind of sort her out, that'd be great and I'd, I'd be really happy to do it. And yeah, it, was, it came from a nice place. But would I let this fucking 24-year-old bimbo loose on my suicidal daughter? No. And... Paris wrote a very nice letter, which Rosie never replied to, even though I keep telling her to. Um, but that was different. That's a different thing. But yeah, anyway. So Vicky's a pretty good life coach as far as she goes. <laughs> she does her best. 
She gave me this badge that says, I have Asperger's, and I do wear it. Um, yes, yeah, selling, selling more stuff, selling to your existing customers. It's easy, it's simple, it's cheap, because the higher cost of marketing has already been spent, um, and it's highly profitable for that reason. You know, if I sell a DVD to someone who's been on my list for a while, um, DVD set probably cost me five or ten quid or something to have made. Three hundred pound, it's like two hundred ninety pound profit. Um, that's not a bad return <laughs> for me. But the best thing of all, the simplest, easiest, and most profitable of all, um, but the one that business owners don't do, is sell at higher prices. Now, when people do consulting with me, which isn't that often, or if they have a phone call or something, it's a little bit like I said at the beginning here. They come along, or they come onto the call. They, they want me to give them some fabulously long, complicated direct mail sequence or something, or something they can, you know, they, they've got these high expectations. And often I just say, put your prices up, man, and come back in six months' time. Because that's all it takes. When you put your prices up several times, haven't you? I know the first few times you were a bit, mm, should I? And you've not had any price resistance, have you? Yeah. No. And you've had people say, oh, that's too much, but then you just go, oh, go ahead. Yeah. And how, how easy was it? Well, it was easy as writing an email. Yeah, right. Yeah. And how, I mean, uh, what, what's it done for your profits? Oh, yeah, massively. <laughs> what you talked about before, all the other stuff that I'm able to do. Because of that. Is a result of the fact that I've what I'm charging for the double. And do you get better customers and clients from it? Oh, yeah. And this, they're, no, they're my friends, a lot of them, you know, now. Um. Yeah. It's the same with, same with Elite. You know, I charge these guys a lot of money. Um, I'll invoice you later for this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I charge a lot of money for Elite and stuff, but they've become my friends as well. And I, they are the best people. And they've been coming, some of them, for Kat and Michelle, for Drew, for nearly four years. Which is pretty fucking amazing, really. You get less time for murder, don't you? We get refunds. Yeah, we get rebate. Right, and of course, Nirvana is selling more stuff to more people under higher prices. And that is the crux of what we're going to be doing. What are you smirking at? Hmm. Did I say crux? Ho, ho, ho. Right, so that, that is the place to be, selling more stuff at higher prices to more people. But what, the way to do it is to set the foundations first, which is the higher prices. And we do that in two ways. We do that with premium pricing, which we're going to cover today. And we also do it um, through premium positioning. Now, the two things are not the same, though they do go hand in hand, which is why I teach them together. Because obviously, if you're, a, if you're an expert, you would expect to be charging a high rate. Uh, and if you're charging a high rate, people would expect you to be an expert. Makes sense. I remember the Dan Kennedy thing a few years ago, about 10 years ago now. What the fuck is that? I'll dribble. <laughs> um, and I was talking to a guy who was selling web franchises. Because I'm not going to name him and stuff, but he was selling web franchises. And he couldn't sell them at five grand a, a time. No one wanted them. And I don't know whether Dan told him to do this or he just did it himself, but he, and he's since become a big player in, in my kind of industry. Um, so he put the price at the 55 grand. Well, when he put the price up, he couldn't keep them, you know, they were flying off the shelf because the price itself conferred a certain image. And if you think about it, I mean, I looked at, when I first went into business for myself, I thought about getting a franchise. And... I, I researched some of them, and there was the obvious ones like McDonald's and stuff, but I didn't want to get into that. But there were the stuff that you can do on your own. There was one which was um, wheelie bin cleaning. Um, one was chewing gum removal off the floors and things. They were quite good business models. Hmm? Chimney sweeping is a good one. Yeah? And I looked at these things, and the thing is, although I know, I know nothing about marketing at that time, so this was all new, but I, knew, I, I remember from my own reaction... The ones that were like four grand for a franchise didn't appeal, but the ones were maybe 50 to 75 grand did, like Diner Rod. Because the price gives it a certain image, doesn't it? You know, well, they're charging 75 grand for it, it must be worth something. It's not logical, but we're not logical species. 
And if you're wondering why I don't have a moustache, by the way, it's because it's ginger. <laughs> well, there's nothing worse than having ginger hair, is there? Hey? Why did that just It just does. <laughs> just does. You've spent a time in my brain before. You know what it's like. No, you know what it's like. So, that was the principle number one. Ignorance about the way the world of business works and, and these fundamental things of you can't do the same things everyone else is doing, all those things. Um, absolutely vital to understand those. And it's, it's not just random, it's absolutely vital that you understand it because when it comes to positioning tomorrow, some of the things you do, you need a thick skin, you need a spine. Um, people say one of the hardest things in, in life and business is to say no. I accept that, but what's even harder than that is, is putting your head above the parapet and standing up for... Um, I, mean, I, I actually don't have a problem with this. I've, I've struggled with this somewhat because I think it was Vegard asked me, um, a few, about a year or so ago, he says, can you, because I, I was soliciting, I was just soliciting, <laughs> no, I was soliciting um, uh, topics for, for the coaching calls, because, you know, I've done probably the best part of 60 coaching calls now for the inner circle, and I'm frankly getting fed up with it, because uh, what do you talk about? Um, so that's why I'm doing more interviews, like Vicky and a few other people. Um, and he said, can you do something on teaching us to not give a fuck? And we, we spoke about this, didn't we? Because you said I should get more involved in mindset and stuff, mm -hmm. which I think you're probably right. And I thought long and hard about it, and the, answer, the thing is I don't know how to teach it because I'm wired up this way. And the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. With the Asperger's thing, what can be a definite disadvantage? I mean, if you notice, I'm not making much eye contact today. I've noticed that because I'm not getting anything from it. Um, I do it because it works. But things like that can be a disadvantage. But the advantage the commensurate advantage with that is you don't give a fuck what people think. And most Aspies are the same. You just don't. Now, those who are bullied, that's the different thing because they get put into a victim mentality. I got out of that when I was seven years old by beating the shit out of the school bully. Um, but essentially, the way we are wired up, we don't care. We don't feel grief either in the same way. It's great. So the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. So I can't actually teach people very well how to not give a fuck. So you have to learn that one yourself. But they got asked me. But whether you're naturally that way inclined or not, I suspect Chris probably is. But whether you're naturally inclined that way or not, you're going to have to learn to do it because, you know, you get a barrage of hate mail. I know it can upset some people. It just makes me laugh. I don't, I don't even reply anymore. I used to reply and wind them up. The ones that get me are, please take me off this list. Are you too fucking stupid to click the link? But I think you've done that before, haven't you? And people say, well, you took me off the list and you said, are you too stupid to click the link below? Do it yourself. Oh, look, I'll do it for you. There you go. Well, that was hard, wasn't it? Um, but yeah, you're going to have to learn to, do the, to, to grow a thick skin. One of the things Michelle is always bending my ear about is her brother <laughs> and his approach to prices and how he gets beaten down on price so that he has to beat him up again. Because Michelle's quite tough on this kind of thing. But, you know, you're going to have to. And it does take work. And as we'll talk about in positioning, I mean, there's some, uh, you don't have to be an arsehole like I am all the time. Uh, <laughs> you can if you want to be. I love it. I think it's great. But, you know, my, say my opinions on religion and abortion and things, I'm very vocal about them. And it does upset some people. And I don't give a shit. Um, but some people will actually take that to heart and, and get upset themselves because they're upsetting others. Probably more women than men, to be honest. But, hey. It's your fault for not being born with a penis. It's true. It's so much easier to have one simple hose as opposed to all that complicated internal plumbing. You don't know. I do know, because I see... Oh, for fuck's sake. All right, let's... Let, I wasn't going to get into this, but let's. <laughs> <laughs> but let's. You walk into a chemist or a, or a supermarket and you've got, like, men's products and you've got you know, shaving foam, soap, toothpaste and stuff. Women's, it goes on forever. And I know that's all for their internal bits, but... I mean, you've got panty liners, panty pads, ones with wings, one without wings, ones that go up, one that just line your gusset. For fuck's sake. Choice. Choice. Yeah, but we don't have to worry about that. We don't dribble. Well, we do a little bit, but... No matter how hard you shake your peg, at least one drop goes down your leg. 
truth. Well, I'm not denying that. Do you know why they're that funny shape at the end? Seriously. Penis. Mushroomed. Helmet, you know. This is true. It's because it's an effective pump for pumping out the semen of your predecessor. This is why porn is so... Uh, this is why porn is, is so, so popular. Because... This, and this is why men watching other people having sex is a, is a turn-on for them. Because it, it, what the, in the evolutionary terms, the, the female is um, available for mating and probably procreating. So, so you see someone shame, well, I'm going to get in there next. I mean, my helmet will pump out all this jizz and mine will go in afterwards. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you can leave that in, by the way. <laughs> Just take out the references that I said at the beginning. <laughs>